The Senate Labor Committee will come to order for Tuesday, March 5th. And I'll note that a quorum is present, and we're going to begin. Uh, Senator McEwen, I believe you're filling in for Senator Pappas in presenting Senate File 3787. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's correct. Um, Senator Pappas, unfortunately, had a, a funeral to attend this afternoon, so I was not able to be here, but I'm a co-author on the bill, so I agreed to go ahead and, and present it today. Shall I proceed? Uh, Senator um, McEwen, I believe there's an A7 amendment. Is an author's amendment? Yes, that's correct. Uh, there is an A7 author's amendment um, that we would like to adopt right away to get the bill and in the form. This is the first like stop of the bill. So Senator McEwen moves the A7 as an author's amendment. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Motion prevails. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, I will also note that I do have an A6 amendment before the committee, um, and there is also a testifier here in support of that A6 amendment, but I'd like to go ahead and hold the adoption of that amendment so that we can hear the testimony, and, and that can be part of our discussion today. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Senate file 3787 as amended. Um, this clarifies and modifies our earned sick and safe time law that we passed last year, makes some improvements to it, some clarifications, and um, I'm going to go ahead and defer here to our commissioner, Commissioner Blissenbach, to go through the bill and to tell us about these changes, and, and then we'll um, um, also stand for any questions, of course. Commissioner, welcome to the committee. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. It's great to be back. Um, good to see all of you. Uh, so thank you. Um, my name is Nicole Blissenbach. I'm the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 3787, the Earn Sick and Safe Time Modifications Bill. The provisions in this bill were formed as the department implemented the Earn Sick and Safe Time law. DLI conducted extensive outreach and education for employers and heard from them about some of the challenges they were experiencing while implementing the Earn Sick and Safe Time law. Their feedback was instrumental in crafting many of the provisions of this bill. Uh, DLI also heard from employee organizations about how the ESST law could better meet the needs of working people in the state of Minnesota. Uh, and their feedback was also instrumental in the crafting of this bill. With that, I can provide an overview of what's included and highlight some of the places where feedback from stakeholders is coming through. So sections one through three, um, I'll start with section one, adds uh, 177.50 to the Earn Sick and Safe Time uh, and to the Commissioner's Compliance Order Authority under 177.27. Um, this gives DLI enforcement authority over provisions which prohibited employers from entering into contract for labor services uh, with an, a contractor who's not complying with the ESST law. That already existed in the, in the law. This is making sure that we have compliance, over author, uh, compliance authority over that provision. Section 2 provides the commissioner rulemaking authority for earn sick and safe time. The funding for rulemaking was included as part of the broader appropriation to DLI for earn sick and safe time um, passed in 2023, so no additional appropriation is needed. The amendment, the author's amendment today did extend the timeline for the appropriations so that we can proceed with rulemaking um, without that money expiring. Section three lays out remedies related to an employer's failure to provide earn sick and safe time. Um, this is really a, a result of hearing from um, municipalities who have earn sick and safe time ordinances and some of the challenges they've encountered uh, with enforcing earn sick and safe time when an employer did not offer earn sick and safe time um, or did not keep records to establish how much earn sick and safe time should have been provided to employees. So under this provision, the employer would be liable to the employee for an amount equal to the earn sick and safe time that should have been provided or could have been used at the employee's base rate of pay 
plus an additional amount as liquidated damages. Um, and if records are insufficient to determine the amount of earned sick and safe time that should have been provided, the employer is liable for an amount equal to 48 hours um, of earned sick and safe time at the employee's base rate of pay, plus an equal amount in liquidated damages. Section four. Uh, removes the current requirements employers must follow for providing information on uh, earning statements. Uh, we did hear from employers that this was a burden and some were unable to um, get, their, uh, get that properly noted on the earning statement. Uh, later in section 11, we'll walk through the new requirements so that employees are aware of how much earned sick and safe time they have available. Mm. Section five makes a change related to how employers must calculate the rate at which earned sick and safe time is paid. Um, this replaces hourly rate with base rate and then defines base rate. This was what was included the, in the author's amendment as well. Um, we're making this change because we heard from a number of employers and employer organizations that this was uh, confusing and complex, and it makes it clear that the intent of the law was to have employers provide earned sick and safe time at that base rate, not including bonuses, things like holiday pay, um, or shift differentials that are above and beyond that base hourly rate. Section six amends the definition of employee under the earned sick and safe time law by clarifying that an employee who is anticipated by the employer to work for at least 80 hours in a year qualifies. Um, this is really to address some confusion over when uh, the, an employee was eligible to start accruing earned sick and safe time. Section seven amends the provisions of the law for the accrual of earned sick and safe time in cases where the employer chooses to front load the hours um, under the option of front loading 48 hours, uh, employers are required to pay out accrued but unused sick time at the end of the year. This change updates the rate at which they need to be paid out to the base rate, which conforms with the change we made earlier. Section eight amends the list of eligible uses for which an employee may use accrued earned sick and safe time to include the need to make arrangements for funeral services or other matters related to the death of a family member. In section nine, uh, the change on line 8.5 clarifies that an employer may require reasonable documentation that earned sick and safe time is covered under the eligible uses only when an employee earns sick and safe time for more than three consecutive scheduled work days. Um, there was some confusion about three consecutive days, uh, whether that meant work days or calendar days. So that's clarifying that. The change beginning on line 8.19 ensures that employers using earned sick and safe time for absence due to domestic assault, sexual assault, or stalking of an employee or an employee's family member are not subject to more stringent rec documentation requirements than use for other purposes. I think that was probably an oversight in the initial bill. Section 10 addresses the increments of time in which earned sick and safe time may be used. Previously, and this was based on feedback as well, previously employees were entitled to use earned sick and safe time in the smallest increment of time tracked by the employer's payroll system. Um, we heard that that proved to be somewhat challenging. Um, so this change provides that an employer is not required to provide leave in less than 15 minute increments. Section 11, uh, I mentioned earlier, section four removed the existing requirement for employers regarding earn sick and safe time on earning statements. So instead of requiring on an earning statement, this requires earn sick and safe time hours um, to be either on the earning statement or um, electronically in a way that is still accessible to the employee. And it requires the employee, employers maintain those records for three years and that those records be available to the commissioner upon demand, similar to uh, records that are required uh, in our wage and hour laws. Paragraph 12 uh, details the employer's obligation to destroy or return records uh, when requested by the employee to uh, make sure that they're not obligated to destroy or return records if state or federal law requires the employer to retain the records. 
Section 13 uh, provides that earn sick and save time protections apply to all earn sick and save time, not just the minimum amount of earn sick and save time offered under the new law. The effective date of this change in the amendment was pushed back to January 1 of 2025 uh, in order to give employers some time to effectuate that change. Section 14 um, provides that when there is a separation from employment and the employee is rehired uh, within the 180 days that previously accrued earn sick and save time that had not been used must be reinstated. But this clarifies that um, it's considered used if it were paid out upon separation to the employee's benefit. And then section 15 uh, extends the rulemaking appropriation, I mentioned this earlier, that was included in last year's budget to ensure that the department has enough time to um, complete the rulemaking before the funds expire. And I think that gets us through the bill. I know that was quick. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, I'll remain here if there are any questions, although I do have to head over to the House Labor Committee in approximately seven minutes. So, so why don't we start with, are there any questions from members of the committee for the commissioner in case um, they have questions for later? Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator McEwen and Commissioner Liesenbach. Um, so, yeah, that was a lot of changes. So this is not only a technical bill, it's a policy bill, too. Would that be correct? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, I think that it's a modification bill. So it is making changes that we heard from um, our stakeholders uh, will help to implement the law as it is currently written, or as it would be written if we changed it. Mr. Chair. Commissioner, uh, Senator Dorn, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so you'd mentioned the stakeholders' feedback and process uh, in the developing of this bill. Um, so after you kind of came up with the, uh, some of these ideas, did you reach back out to them and kind of continue to talk with them through some of the things that uh, your changes and the proposed changes? Uh, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Dornick, yes. Uh, in fact, we've continued meeting, um, and the amendment today reflects a conversation uh, we had on Friday of last week with a number of um, organ employer organizations uh, related to base rate of pay. They were concerned about the initial change we had. Um, so we did reflect those that feedback in that amendment. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, so this, this bill, I agree with the concept. We do. Uh, just the, the rush that it was last year and then we see it's only been in for 10 weeks and we're doing some, some modification, which is good. Uh, to fix it, uh, but uh, I know I have received uh, calls or emails and the frustration of this, um, both of the cost of implementing it and uh, just trying to navigate through some of these things. Um, I know that on the bill last year, there was a line for uh, expenses for if the House would implement this, and uh, some of these small businesses, and I know we tried really hard to exempt just some of the, the real small businesses from this expense and some of the, uh, the smaller businesses, they, they, they want to do it right. And so they struggled with uh, implementing it and they have to hi they hired this one in particular. I walked into Lumberyard and I'll get my stuff and they asked me and what are you guys doing up there? And so they just kind of were venting to me of the struggle with the implementation and the expense of um, you know, meeting with the lawyers and get their handbook and making sure that they don't break the rules. So, um, so I'm hoping that you will be really um, careful with the implement as they're changing again because the confusion of this is the way it was, now it's this way, and, and uh, it takes a while to get that information out to all the districts. So uh, I guess my question is, um, I guess I want your assurance that uh, as these businesses are navigating through this, that uh, that your um, uh, well, Dolly will be take that in, into consideration. Mr. Chair, Senator Dornick, um, absolutely. Uh, we are working with employers every day. Uh, we've done uh, probably the largest scale outreach that I've seen since I've been with the department since 2019 to ensure that people who want information are getting the information. Um, and, you know, I think we, we spoke earlier uh, this session about 
our focus right now is education um, and information uh, to make sure that people understand what their obligations are. Um, so we're giving people an opportunity to come into compliance if it's flagged that they're not in compliance um, and really getting that information out. That's absolutely what our goal is and, um, and what we're continuing to do. Uh, we have a lot of really great resources on our website, um, but we've also been going out and meeting with people. Um, I think if we counted up all the people who have been in our presentations, I think it was close to 9,000 uh, people that we've touched since last session, um, and also working with our partners, many of the employer organizations, to do webinars uh, and other uh, educational outreach. Um, but that does remain our primary goal. But we also know that the policy behind this bill was to make sure that employees, every employee, regardless of who they worked for or where they worked, uh, had access to um, earn sick and save time to care for their, themselves or their family members under the circumstances outlined in the law. Mr. Chair, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so switching to rulemaking a little bit, uh, how come rulemaking wasn't put in last year? Was there a reason that that didn't get put in? Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Senator Dornick, um, that was taken out uh, in the omnibus bill last year. Um, the funding was included, uh, but it was taken out, I believe, because maybe a, a technical issue. Um, but we are hearing from employers that rulemaking would, in fact, be helpful because it would provide some clarity to fill to do what rulemaking is supposed to do to fill in some of the gaps that the that the law may not have that we are trying to do through guidance and, and helping people, but it would be good to have that in formal rulemaking. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so I guess uh, as you do this rulemaking, um, I'm not sure how you let us know, but I guess I'd really be appreciative of as that some of that's changing. This is really important to all of, uh, all of us. And so just hoping that uh, we can keep that dialogue that we've had in the past just as that uh, moves forward. Thank you. Other questions? If not, you look like you have to go for your... <laughs> and, and I do, Mr. Chair, I do have um, other staff at okay. Labor and Industry Appreciate who are here, here and can answer questions. Thank you. So. Senator McEwen, you have next agenda item is uh, Laura Hainer to testify. Are you ready for that? Yes, Mr. Chair. Ms. Hainer, could you come forward and identify yourself and begin your testimony? Thank you. Hi, I'm Laura Hainer. Um, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Airline Pilots Association International, the largest pilot union in the world with more than 2,400 pilots in Minnesota. My name is Laura Hainer and I'm a Minnesota resident and a Minneapolis-based pilot uh, for Delta Airlines. On behalf of the thousands of pilots in Minnesota, we support the amendment offered by Chair McEwen. The purpose of this amendment is to ensure that flight crew are treated the same as everybody else in this room and all other Minnesotans under the Minnesota Earned Sick and Safe Time Law. Not only is treating flight crew different under this law unfair, but it's also unnecessary. Some of you may have heard from airline representatives regarding the need to treat airline crew differently because we are union members organized under the Railway Labor Act or because of the Airline Deregulation Act of 1978. Neither of these claims are valid. Airlines claim that the Airline Deregulation Act preempts states from legislating on employment-related issues, including leave time. The Airline Deregulation Act's narrowly drawn preemption provision prohibits state regulation of pricing, routes, and services. It does not extend to state labor laws, including paid and family, paid family and sick leave. This is accepted law, and the Supreme Court recently declined to hear arguments otherwise. Minnesota, like all other states, has the right to provide paid sick leave. The individual and public health reasons for including flight crew under state law should be the justification for this much needed fix. Airline employees often face punishment for using sick leave when they are sick. By including pilots and flight attendants in the Minnesota Earned Sick and Safe Time Law, Minnesota, like other states leading in leave policy, will enable airline crew members to take sick time when we are ill or to care for ill family members without facing penalty from our employers. 
It will also ensure we are not spreading illness to our customers and fellow employees. Thank you for helping all Minnesota families use earned sick time to care for our loved ones in times of need by supporting the McEwen Amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Any questions from Ms. Hainer? If not, Senator McEwen, did you want to move the amendment now, or because I assume that's the A6 is talking about that issue? I see. Um. I think we can, yes, that would, I, I was wondering the same thing, Mr. Chair. Okay, Senator McEwen moves A6 amendment, which is in the packets, I see. Can I make a quick statement, Mr. Please, Chair? Yes, you can. I'm not, I'm not saying we vote on it. I figured oh, sure, we'll be sure. Discussing. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, so the A6 amendment in your packet um, uh, does exactly what we just heard, this excellent testimony um, from um, our, our testifier here is that it will include uh, airline employees in the earned sick and safe time. Um, and correct, they had been excluded previously um, because of some discussion about federal preemption law, but after discussions with lawyers uh, who have possess a great deal of expertise around federal law preemption issues, um, it's clearly been shown that state legislators have every right to include workers um, organized under federal law um, in earned sick and safe time and other types of leave policies. But we feel that the legal precedent is clear and that we must fulfill our legislative intent to cover as many Minnesotans under the earned sick and safe time as possible. That's what this amendment does. These workers should not be treated any differently or less than any other Minnesotan worker. So I ask for your support. Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Thank you for your testimony. Uh, so I'm not sure if this will be t t to you or if uh, Senator McEwen can answer it. So uh, as far as the when you're based somewhere else, I guess I think that's part of the, the confusion. Mm -hmm. If you're based in, well, let's say you live in South Dakota and you're based in Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport. How, how will this bill work? In a, or if you're... Uh, based in Atlanta and you live in Minnesota, just some of those uh, complicated situations that I'm sure there's some out there. How does, how will that work? Mr. Chair, I just want to make sure that um, um, individual workers who may not have a sense of how the policy will be implemented. And so I'm going to ask if um, somebody from the Department of Labor and Industry can join us to perhaps answer that question. Yes, there? somebody from DLR. And if you have something, to, feel sure. free to speak. Um, I'll, de I'll defer to them to answer the um, specifics on the law, but I will say for flight crew, it's generally everything for labor laws is generally based on where we are based, not where we're, um, not where we're living, but where we're based and not our, over where our physical location is. Thank so, you. So, Ms. Hainer, if, if you are, if you, you said you were based in Minneapolis, St. Paul, so yes. you would be covered by it regardless of where you're working. If you, if one of your colleagues is based in Atlanta, they wouldn't be covered by our law even if they spent half their time here. That is uh, how it typically is. Um, that is typically how it applies to flight crew. I okay. defer to you for the specific law. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the law, oh, my name is Peter Nicolai. Well, please sort of, identify yourself for the yeah, committee. Yeah, I'm Peter Nicolai. I'm a... Uh, Supervisor at the Minnesota Department of Labor and the Labor Standards Division in charge of earned sick and safe time. Um, Typically, the, the law requires that an employee work 80 hours in Minnesota. So, if somebody is just in transition, uh, <clears throat> working in Atlanta, flying into Minnesota for a little bit of time, unless they hit the 80 hour threshold, they're probably not covered by the law. Okay. Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. So I'm having a little trouble hearing you. So oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if I got what you said. So if okay. you repeat it, that'd be great. Sure. Thank you. Under the statute, uh, the definition of uh, presently, the definition of employee requires that the the worker work 80 hours in Minnesota. So if the worker is stationed, if the pilot is stationed in Atlanta and flies into Minnesota, if they're not here a total of 80 hours, they're not going to start accruing earned sick and safe time. Sir Gunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just clarification of that. So how do you keep track of, let's say somebody is based out of Atlanta, 
but they come to Minnesota pretty regularly. Who keeps track of the number of hours? That is uh, the job of the employer. Um, and uh, it, you know, it's very similar to somebody who works or who lives in North Dakota but works in Moorhead, right? Or, you know, lives in Wisconsin and, and, and works in Woodbury. Uh, the employer would have to keep track of the time that they are here in Minnesota. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just additional clarification. So let's say they're based out of Atlanta, but they spend over 80 hours coming into Minneapolis airport uh, during the year. But so the employer in Atlanta would need to keep track of how many hours that they're coming to the state of Minnesota? Right, but the, the, the way the law would work is it's time spent in Minnesota. So if they get sick in Atlanta, it, it'd be subject to whatever Atlanta's law is. But if they're sick while they're in Minnesota, they could use that to, to earn sick okay. and safe time. Mr. Chair? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, okay. Uh, so how many other states have a law like this in relationship to airlines? Does anybody know? I don't know the answer to that. I don't have a specific number, but there are a few other states. Um, one in particular, uh, Washington has a law like that. And for Washington, um, it applies only to the, uh, for Delta Airlines, we have a Seattle base, and the Washington laws apply to uh, the Seattle-based pilots. It doesn't apply to me when I fly to Seattle. It just applies to Washington-based pilots. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yep. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I would just say to the author that, and I know Sandy Papp is not here, Senator Papp is not here, but that you might consider putting a provision in there like Washington that it just applies to what's based out of the state of Minnesota, at least initially. And uh, I just think it, it, I mean, it's going to be difficult to just keep with the amount of air traffic going back and forth all over the place um, to, for companies to keep track of all that. But anyway, just my suggestion. Senator McEwen, that, yeah, talking with, again, because Senator Pappas is bill, you might make sure it's clarified because we want to make sure looking at, I mean, how it fits in with contracts and everything else to make sure it's, the amendment does what you want to do, namely that the people who are based here are covered and so on, so yeah. Yes. But Senator Dornick on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so uh, I was just going to clarify it. This has got another technical thing too is, you know, when they're in Minnesota and they're here and then you get on the plane and then you're not here very often, just how are they going to implement some of that time too? That's just something that uh, I'm not sure if the state of Washington has dealt with it and I guess you're not really aware of that. So just a, uh, it looks like a, a point that might need to be addressed uh, as we're moving forward in this process. And then uh, Miss. Hainer, is that correct? Yes. So it's, can you tell me what a typical week, uh, work week looks like for you as a stewardess? How does... Uh, and, yeah. I'm a first officer for Delta. Uh, Pardon me? I'm a pilot for Delta. I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, I, I don't our, know why I said that. I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, our schedules vary. We get a schedule a month out for the whole month, um, and it's hourly. We have to fit within an hourly window. So... Uh, I don't know that we have a typical week uh, because we might have, for example, for March, my schedule is very heavily loaded at the back half of the month and lighter on the front half. Um, I would say the most typical trip that a pilot flies in a week is a three to four day trip. They leave on the first day and don't get back for two to three days. They might be coming back and forth in Minneapolis, but then spending nights in other cities. Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, my apologies. I, I feel, I don't know why I even said that. I'm so sorry. So please uh, accept my apology for that. Thank you for your work and, and all your uh, co-workers here. Thanks you so much for coming. Appreciate. Uh, I know when I fly, well, I don't fly it often, but uh, it's, it's so uh, nice to know the, the professionalism and the kindness when we come into the plane and all of those things are so appreciated. So uh, again, thank you for being here. Thank you for your work, and uh, um, just uh, appreciate all that you guys do. Thank, thank you. you. Is there further discussion on the A6 amendment? Go ahead. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I guess I'm I'm still also a little perplexed. I don't under, you know I fully support that our that our Minneapolis St. Paul based flight crews have this, but I just I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around how do we how how does Minnesota then dictate to another state when you're you're based in Atlanta and you happen to be here and and then and then where where I, so is that because it's 80 hours over two years if I'm correct. Right, that that's that's the amount of earned sick and save time. It's forty, it's one hour for every thirty, and eighty is the most you can accrue. So I'm just trying to figure, like, wrap my head around how uh, how that works with other people that work from uh, out other states that are based in other states. I mean, I don't I don't see how our law can reach into those other states. I'm just trying to wrap my head around. So if there could be a little clarification, just and, for me, that'd be and great. I, I think. Um, yeah. So. The, there, there's two 80-hour thresholds in, in the law. On the definition of employee, you have to work 80 hours a year in order to, uh, and then the amended law will be anticipated to work 80 hours a year in Minnesota, right? So uh, 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 under the amended rule, the uh, pilot, the pilot sta stationed out of Atlanta, you might not anticipate they're gonna work 80 hours in, in Minnesota. So they may not be covered by that. Sarah McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think also just to like to step back a little bit, just for an understanding, a worker only accrues uh, earned sick and safe time for hours worked in Minnesota, and then can only be they can only use them for shifts scheduled in Minnesota. So this is very much a Minnesota-centered um, policy. So I just want to make sure that people understand that too. And I will encourage um, when Senator Papp, when you talk to Senator Pappas to make sure she and the department and Senate Council clarify that somehow. Sure. Is there further discussion on the A6 amendment? Mr. Chair. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think a little comfort language in the bill would help in that area, just to clarify things. The other question I have is, um, do you have sick and safe time that you've negotiated with Delta right now, and will this override it? Um, this would be concurrent with our negotiated sick time. We um, we have a certain amount of sick hours that are negotiated with our in our contract that are company wide. Uh, what we don't have with that is the ability to care for ill family members using that sick time. Mr. Gunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thanks for that response. See, I. I uh, served 16 years on the school board and I was chief negotiator with the certified staff. And one of the things that makes me uncomfortable on this labor committee is how many things, bills that were passing and become law that should be a negotiated at the negotiation table. And, uh, you know, nothing against you I, I, or, you know, the airline people, it's just the, uh, I believe in earned and safe sick time. Uh, the labor market's tight. Employers have to offer what uh, benefits they can in order to uh, get the best employees possible. And I have two part-time employees, and I give them the best I possibly can, income-wise and otherwise. But it just, and I guess it's a kind of a general statement, not necessarily for airlines. It's just, uh, draws me to pause to see how many bills we passed, including this one, that should be negotiated between the employer and the employees versus a bill passed by the state of Minnesota. So um, I, uh, anyway, that's my thoughts. Thanks on this amendment. Senator McEwen on the A6 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to respond to uh, Senator Dornick's um, statement. I just wanted to clarify that earned sick and, safe, sick and safe time includes significant worker protections that many sick time plans do not. So it is actually incredibly important that we passed the law last year here in the state of Minnesota to provide a floor and a baseline for what we expect employers to provide in their policies. They can go above and beyond that if they want to. They can be a super employer and do even better. But what we'd said are that this is the baseline. They ha these, these things have to be met. 
So I, I, I just want to take issue with that contention that somehow um, the state shouldn't intervene to create a floor. We do that in many, many different areas, and this is just one area where we create the floor, and you say you can't, you can't go below that. On the A6 amendment, is there further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. We have other witnesses. I don't know if others have amendments. While we take the witnesses first, um, Lauren Schothorst from the chamber. Thank you very much. And when she's done, Cap O'Rourke would be up next. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Lauren Schothorst, and I am the Director of Workplace Management and Workforce Development Policy for the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, a statewide organization representing more than 6,300 businesses and more than half a million employees throughout Minnesota. On behalf of our members, a majority of whom are small to mid-sized businesses, thank you for the opportunity to comment on Senate File 3787, legislation seeking to modify the recently enacted unfunded paid sick and safe time mandate imposed on Minnesota employers. During the 2023 legislative session, the Minnesota Chamber testified on numerous occasions with our staunch opposition to the imposition of this mandate for a number of reasons. We sought to limit the scope of the mandate, provide our smallest businesses with some relief from its financial and operational impacts, and ensure employers have the flexibility to manage these new requirements in ways that are feasible and not cost prohibitive. Further, we specifically ask that legislators work to mitigate the burdens of the onerous compliance requirements that now necessitate the need for Senate File 3787. While this bill some in includes some clarifications necessary to reduce confusion resulting from the interpretation of this new law uncovered during its rollout and implementation, it also includes increased compliance, rulemaking and remedies, as well as expanding the scope of the mandate itself. The cost of doing business in the state increased significantly as a result of the 2023 legislative session. After a record-setting number of new labor mandates, workplace restrictions, and business taxes, employers are very concerned about their ability to su succeed and grow in Minnesota. The Chamber supports an approach that limits additional resources and reduces existing cost burdens and mandates on employers who are doing their best to keep Minnesotans employed. We support enacting technical and substantive changes to address the unnecessarily onerous compliance concerns, as well as statutory modifications to address overreach and issues uncovered during implementation. In that context, while we appreciate some of these clarifications are included in the underlying bill, we believe that balanced employment-related policy benefits both workers and employers, as well as taxpayers, while enabling our economy to grow. It is for these reasons that the Chamber encourages members to pursue the necessary clarifications while including more policy changes that the business community has advocated for before and after enactment. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions for Ms. Shadows? Senator Goonhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, you said it better than I could. <laughs> I think the problem with the state is we pass one size fits all. You know, and I know you said it's more like a floor. I see it more similar to a state sledgehammer because it's got consequences for every business. And we have ability to change employers. Uh, the labor market's tight. If you want good people, you're going to have to pay them a decent wage and benefits. And the state inserts itself there, and I think to a certain degree it's detrimental, detrimental to some of the businesses. I mean... I'll just name one, Medtronic. They started in a garage, if, I, if my history, uh, uh, you know, a small business. And it's especially onerous on these small businesses. And 3M was a small business at one time. You know, I mean, you're taking these small businesses and you're, you're hampering it with state laws and, and complications at cost that they might not be able to uh, to, to work with and pay in order to become successful. And yet they could become another 3M, another Medtronic, we don't know. And the more uh, obstacles we put in front of these small businesses, and the last statistic I read several years ago is 80% of our employees in our nation work for a smaller, mid-sized business. And yet we're making it difficult 
And I know we have been a prosperous state. I know we got a lot of Fortune 500 companies, but they started out small. And we should be creating a network of regulations and uh, reasonable taxes so that we can see these businesses prosper and it'll be better for all of us in the long run. Just my thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, next we have Cap O'Rourke from Smoke Cities. Welcome to the committee and please identify yourself for the record. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, my name is Cap O'Rourke. I'm the Executive Director of Minnesota Association of Small Cities. We advocate on behalf of the over 700 cities who have populations under 5,000. Um, <clears> we are, our primary concern with this legislation that was passed last year and this bill is the lack of clarity surrounding paid on-call firefighters. Um, we have, our cities have been struggling to properly figure out how to best apply this to their employees and th this specific grouping of employees. Uh, we had a call with uh, Department of Labor and Industry this last fall. This was one of the primary focuses of the questions from our member cities. At that time, we were told that there would be more clarity coming out in future FAQs from the department. Unfortunately, those Future FAQs that came out did not provide more clarity. In fact, both of the ones that were referenced onto this topic advised our cities to hire an employment law attorney. So we are, and, and we acknowledge that different cities use, rely on their paid on call fire, firing staff in different manners. So there is um, some degrees as to how often these people are working and scheduled for work, um, but our cities, our smaller cities, are really struggling with the proper way to get clarity on this issue and how to apply this law. Um, so we are asking for more clarity. We're trying to work with the author, Bill Author, and the agency to get that, but right now it is, it, it's, I cannot turn back to our members and say that the solution is for you to hire an employment law attorney to figure out uh, the, the state guideline. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I read your letter here that, uh, thanks for your testimony. And, you know, I attended a meeting uh, inside my district for EMS and the crisis they're in. They don't need more laws mandating benefits. What they need is additional funding and they'll provide the benefits, okay? I mean, they're at a crisis in the rural area, which you kind of indicated, and they're getting larger and larger areas for our ambulances to serve, and they don't have necessary funding to draw new people in. So I would advise us to increase that funding, which I think there is a bill authored by the Democrats to do that, but uh, I just as soon take it out of that building that we're building next door of 730 million or 50 million or whatever it is and give it to the EMS people instead. So thank you for your testimony. I'd encourage the author to address and clarify with Dolly these situations for our firefighters, EMS, and our uh, uh, you know people who serve and are desperately needed in our communities. The last thing we need to do is make it more complicated and expensive and have less people uh, step forward to serve in these areas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Gunhagen. Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I was wondering if uh, somebody from Dolly could come up and maybe give me a little more information on where we're at with this. Are we working towards it? Or Senator McEwen, if you could help get a little more clarity for us, that would be. <laughs> OK, I wasn't sure, so. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, um, Senator Dornick. Um, I, I would add that I, I, as not the lead author of the bill, I have been made aware that there is discussion about this issue, and as um, that uh, Senator Pappas is very much open to um, trying to find a solution and seeing if that's possible. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, I, I will say that we have been having ongoing discussions with Department of Labor and Industry and the chairs. I think um, trying to, as you know, sometimes we're trying to figure out when you put in words and what they, who gets included and who gets excluded. And because this is a unique uh, subset of employees and their, their duties um, and what is required f under ESST compared to what would be required, say, to maintain their professional certifications, um, those are some of the issues that we're 
we're trying to get right. So we're, we're having ongoing discussions, but I'm just raising this point in front of this committee to, to keep the issue alive. Thank you, Mr. O'Rourke. Oh, okay. Senator Kupek. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is just a, a technical question. Are we, are we laying this bill over for um, omnibus, or is this going on to another I stop? Think I this guess. bill is going on its own, I believe. Uh, I believe it was, it's, it's being to referred to state and local. State and local government. That was with the motion she's planning. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion on the bill? Any amendments? Further discussion? Thank you. Senator Dornick. I see that. I misplaced mine. Oh, that's yours. The number? Yeah. So I'd like to offer the A8 amendment. Senator Dornick offers the A8 amendment, and while it's being distributed, maybe you can start explaining it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this, this amendment is one that's not going to be real new, but uh, we tried to do this last year. Just, uh, uh, again, the concept, earn sick and safe, we support that. Uh, we're not against that. We were just trying to do the not one size fits all. So this is just an exemption for... A very small, it's a, an individual employed by a farmer, family farm, or a family farm corporation to provide physical labor on a manage or on manage of a farm if, so it's five or few employees, and then it's kind of a niche thing is with what we learned in the sugar beet uh, harvest up north. They have 15,000 workers that are coming up for just a matter of 14 to 20 days. Um, it's just an incredible amount of crew, and a lot of that crew is, uh, they come up there specifically to take vacation time to be able to help out there. So, uh, and then I heard, as I mentioned earlier, some of these really small uh, businesses that have that relationship with their workers, uh, usually just one, two, three employees, and they give them the time, and, and it's just part, of, almost part of their family. And so this bill, or this uh, amendment is just to, help those small businesses and then with the 21 days or less, it's not only just for the sugar beets, um, it's also for um, the farm in the spring when it's just uh, putting in the crop, it's just a real, uh, it's more than 80 hours, but um, you know, it's, it's temporary, it's just uh, in the spring, depending on the weather, how the crop goes in, and then in the fall, same thing, retired people, uh, a lot of people that just like to help out on the farm, and uh, so that's kind of what the bill does, or I'm sorry, the amendment does, is just that little exemption for uh, those uh, areas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Dornick. Senator McEwen, for your witness. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a question uh, for the amendment author, Senator Dornick. It's, if I may, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a question for Senator Dornick, right. the author of the amendment. Um, is this uh, definition of family farm, does it exist anywhere else in Minnesota law? Um, yes. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember where we got this from. But yeah, we did get to, my might have my researcher help me on this, but yes, we did specifically get it. Or maybe Ms. Carlin can help us. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, members, and Senator Dorning, I, this did come from uh, the agricultural chapter. There's not a, a cross-reference, but that could certainly be added. But these are uh, terms that are used in, I think, maybe Chapter 120-something. But I, okay. I, can, I can get that for you. Um, they are terms used for, like, a small farm. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I, I have um, the Department of Labor and Industry to, here to, to respond to this, um, and then I'll just have a couple sure. words. Please identify yourself and go ahead. Chair, members, my name is Prairie Bly, and I'm Assistant Director for, the, for Labor Standards at the Department of Labor and Industry. Um, I, I think the department is probably wondering whether or not this could be limited to the existing limitations in ESST. If a family farm or family farm corporation is is having someone come and work in Minnesota and they don't anticipate that they're going to be employed for 80 hours or more a year, then they would already be exempt from this. So I think the department's wondering, um, you know, what, what the consideration is in that space. Mr. Chair? 
Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so you're asking if it's under 80 hours, they wouldn't be, is that what you're saying? Is that the question? Yes. So uh, most of these would be over the 80 hours. Uh, up in, the, especially the sugar beet harvest, they're working yeah. lots of hours. Yeah. And then on, uh, in the spring and the fall, again, it's timely. So you're putting in a fair amount of hours in a short period of time due to the weather and then the same in the fall. Mr. Chair, I, I uh, and, and um, Senator Dornick, I'll certainly pass this on to Senator Pappas and I trust that you will also talk with her about your idea. Um, but the workers who work in these situations also get sick. They also have a need to enjoy this benefit just like anybody else, just because they work under different conditions than other workers doesn't mean that they shouldn't qualify for these types of benefits. Um, but as I said, I'll go ahead and um, pass this on to Senator Pappas. As you know, Senator Pappas is, is great about considering different ideas or needs that arise uh, with any of her bills. So um, I'd ask for today um, for members to reject this amendment, um, knowing um, that I will pass on this conversation to Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and. Senator Dornick, thank you. You know, we've had discussions, uh, you and I, ab about this this very situation, um, and, and obviously, um, the the part we talked about those specifically those people, I think, in your area and in my area that come in for the harvest, that it is um, it's a very quick hit of, of of a few weeks, and they will top eighty hours easily uh, in those few weeks, and and what we are. What we're trying to get at it with earn sick and save time are those people who who do not have, you know, that pay, that time off ability. And so the 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 I'm tr the family farms and the under five gives me a little bit of pause because I think there will be there are places that there are those there are workers probably there that we want to give this benefit to this earn sick and save time. But I also think that those those people that are you know for instance. I'm going to take some vacation days from my regular job to go, you know, cash in on the harvest somewhere. That's not really the people that we're trying to, I think, capture with earn sick and safe time. Um, it's a, it's just a, you know, it's a weird little niche uh, thing that I don't think those are, those are the people that we're looking to extend this benefit to. So, so I have a, a, a couple of concerns about it, but I do, I appreciate the intent uh, of where you are going with this because you know I think overall and the goal of this I think when we passed it last year was to get those and we know you know 80 percent of of Minnesota employers they offer this benefit and so this is not this is not a new thing but there are those ones that work um, in some other capacity in some other jobs that don't have you know this ability and those were really the people we were going for so so there is those those this is a weird little subset of people that really this isn't who we're trying to capture with this bill. But so I appreciate uh, this effort moving forward, and 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 I hope you know, Senator Pappas will will think about this too going forward. So, Senator Dornick. thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kupek. Um, so again, it's it's just. We support the concept. We, I just it struggles that there's no exceptions. No, everything is the same, and that's that's what I struggle with. That uh, there's no exceptions. Um, but thank you for your um, clarification there. And uh, I'm still going to ask for a roll call and to vote for it. And um, because it sounds like it's going to the floor, so and I will follow up with Senator Pappas too. So. Thank on, you. The, on the motion of Senator Dornick for the A8 amendment, a roll call has been requested. Jack, could you take the roll? Chair McEwen. No. Vice Chair Hostchild. Senator Dornick. Yes. Senator Grunhagen. Yes. Senator Kupek. Yes. Thank you. Senator Liskey. Senator Marty. No. Senator Umu Verbaden. No. Senator Pappas, Senator Wiesenberg, Senator Hostchild, Senator Liskey, Senator Pappas, Senator Wiesenberg. 
There being three ayes and three nays, the motion does not prevail. Are there other amendments? Senator Goonhagen, Senator Goonhagen, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I have the A4 amendment. If you want to pass that out. You know, let me just say, too, I support earning six, uh, save time. Like I said, I got a couple part-time employees. I work around with them all the time. I actually think, and we did have a bill uh, from the other side of the aisle last session that gave a, I think, a, either a tax credit or a substantial tax reduction for a business that did offer sick and, and uh, safe time. And I think that would be a much better approach versus a one-size-fits-all mandate from the state. So I know at this point it's a little difficult to make, but I do support that. I, I work with my employees on it, and uh, even the agents that work for me, I own an insurance company, I mean an insurance agency, and, uh, but I just think this is not the right approach. It's one size fits all, it's gonna cause more problems. I think we'd have more of a robust market of earned and safe, earn sick and safe time if we provided some tax incentives to businesses to offer it. Anyway, with that, is the A4 handed out? Yes, it is. Okay. Was that in yeah. line with my overall comments? <laughs> I, no, Senator Goonhagen, I was thinking your, your comments didn't seem to, amend, to comment on this <laughs> amendment, but go ahead. Well, I wanted everybody to have it first. Um, okay, what this amendment does, and it uh, lines 1.1 through 1.8, it basically says an individual who serves as a public officer elected to a governing board is appointed to fill a vacancy or in an elected office of a governing body, an individual appointed to serve on a board or commission of governmental sub uh, subdivision or instrumental thereof. And uh, for instance, I served on the Glencoe Silver Lake School Board uh, uh, for 16 years. I would not expect uh, earned sick and safe time for serving on that, you know, on that board. And I consider it an honor to be able to represent the children and also the, uh, the community. Uh, this might apply to areas like the Met Council uh, other boards, we have numerous boards up here in the state, and it just, if they're just there for a short period of time, uh, I think it would be good to exclude them from this mandate that we're putting on businesses. So I'd be open to response from Senator McEwen if she'd like to comment, or Dolly. Senator McEwen. Okay. Oh, if um, our official here from DLI can, can address this. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Gruenhagen. Uh, I am Josiah Moore. I am the legislative coordinator at the Department of Labor and Industry. Um, I would just uh, say that the department has issued FAQs on this topic uh, that already clarify that uh, elected officials uh, don't fall under earned sick and safe time. Uh, so the amendment wouldn't be necessary to, to make earned sick and safe time not apply to the individuals in question. Mr. Chair? Senator Goonhagen. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the individual, the person who just testified from Dolly, so therefore the Met Council or school board member, or can you give several examples that, is it in, is it a regulation or is it in statute, do you know? Go ahead, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. Um, our, so our FAQ, I'll read our FAQ from our website. Uh, so the question is, do governmental units need to provide earned sick and safe time to elected officials? Um, and so what we say is only employees as defined by the ESST law must be provided ESST. Elected officials are not considered employees under the ESST law. So I think it's pretty broad uh, in, in, in applying to all elected officials uh, based on our guidance. And Mr. Moore, you, based on the guidance, do you put that into rule then at some point? Or is that just, does guidance have the, you treat it as force and effective law? Just 
brief. That question would be better answered by one of the other DLI staff, so I'm going to. Go ahead, please. Uh, could you repeat the question for me, please? The question is, does it, is the guidance have the force and effect of law, or how, how does it relate if it's not in rule or whatever? Yeah, we have a uh, statement on our FAQs that they are not for, they're not interpretation, they're for informational purposes. Uh, this would be a perfect example of perhaps a, a rulemaking. Okay, you know, so this may be part of the rulemaking. Yeah. Okay. Senator Goonhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thanks for that response. So my amendment actually deals with appointed also board and commissions. Does that fall under the uh, rules or the, uh, uh, as far as Dolly's concerned, does it deal with appointed board members who probably serve just, ten, you know, incidentally, just like elected ones do? Uh, any comment on that? Um, I... Uh... <coughs> I think that the frequently asked question and answer speaks for itself and uh, would probably, uh, I, I don't know if it applies to appointed individuals if they, are, if they constitute elected or not. Okay. okay. Um, Mr. Chair? Senator Goonhagen. Oh, thank you. Can I divide the amendment? You can just delete whatever part of the amendment you don't want to have. You okay. don't have to divide it. Um, is staff available? We have, Senator Goonhagen. Can yeah, what would be the best way to divide this amendment so that we just address the appointed? It sounds like the elected is already covered. Uh, well, Mr. Chair, I guess you, you could um, just m uh, move uh, lines 1.2 to 1.4 and 1.7 to 1.8, so you just wouldn't be doing that clause, clause 3. Um, okay. So Senator Goonhagen moves the A4 amendment except for lines five and six. Is there a discussion on that? Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Um I'm going to ask members that we vote no on this amendment. I'd like um, Senator Pappas to be able to uh, flush out what this would mean to her bill. And I'm ask, I would ask at this point that we not adopt this amendment. On the amendment, Senator Goonhagen. Oh, thank you. Well, that's unfortunate. Um, I am such good friends with S Senator Pappas, I'm sure she'd approve it, so hopefully she'll include it. <laughs> we are already excluding me, an elected official. It'd be nice if we excluded the uh, other ones that are appointed. So uh, with that, I would encourage a yes vote and roll call. A, a roll call has been requested on the A4 amendment um, with minus lines five and six. Please take the roll. Senator or Chair McEwen. No. Vice Chair Hostile. No. Senator Dornick. Yes. Senator Grunhagen. Yes. Senator Kupek. No. Senator Liskey. Senator Marty. No. Senator Uma Verbaden. No. Senator Pappas, Senator Wiesenberg, Senator Liskey, Senator Pappas, Senator Wiesenberg. There being two ayes and five nays, motion does not prevail. Other amendments? Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I didn't, we don't have any more amendments. Just uh, kind of just a closing few thoughts and... Um, so just uh, with the exemption and, uh, that I tried to get on, uh, I was just thinking about the paid family leave that we did carve out just a little bit of an exemption for 30 employees or less or seasonal workers. So there is a precedent for carving out, and it's, um, again, um, to make it uh, so it's not one size fits all, to look at businesses one by one, um, or at least in the sector they're in, and that there is individuality and there is those certain little niches or little uh, businesses that uh, just don't fit into this slot. It's like, yeah, we fixed it. It's like, well, no, we didn't fix it. Um, as we see, we, we're trying to fix the bill. And uh, just as I mentioned before, um, it's only been implemented in for 10 weeks. And uh, it's, it's been very, uh, I've, again, the, to the commissioner and to you, uh, 
uh, Josiah, you guys did a great job, and it was just a, it was just a big task to get all this out, the information, and you've worked really hard. And so thank you for your work. And um, but uh, to that point, it just it was just uh, needed more time. And I'm hoping that maybe with some of these changes that we will do that to um, uh, the businesses and as they're trying to adjust to. Uh, it was this, but now it's this, and uh, to get the information out there. And so, uh, again, thanks to Senator McEwen for bringing the bill, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. And uh, again, I'm just hoping that we will uh, go slower through this and, and have um, some com more conversations with business owners. Thank you. Senator McEwen moves Senate File 3787 as amended be recommended passing. I believe it goes to the state and local government veterans. That's correct. On that motion, any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion prevails. Senate File 4384, Senator McEwen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Senator McEwen, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I am pleased today to bring a Senate file 4384, which is a labor standards policy bill, um, to the committee today. Um, I'm going to turn the testimony over uh, to someone uh, from the Department of Labor and Industry to detail some of the changes um, that are... Um, contained in the bill, but really there's everything in here from some technical things to clarifying things to some real substantive enfor enforcement issues around child labor. Um, and so with that, Mr. Chair, I will turn it over to the Department of Labor and Industry to run us through the bill. Ms. Bly, please uh, say your name and title for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Chair and members. My name is Prairie Bly, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Labor Standards at the Department of Labor and Industry. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in, in support of Senate File 4384, the Labor Standards Policy and Technical Bill. The Division of Labor and Standards exists to protect the rights of workers and educate employers and employees about their rights under Minnesota labor laws. We ensure workers are paid correctly and workplace rights and responsibilities are enforced for all workers and help employers prevent employment and labor law violations before they occur. Labor standards also answers wage and hour questions about breaks, minimum wage, overtime, pregnant and new parents' rights, child labor, prevailing wage, and wage theft. This bill makes several changes throughout Chapter 177, 181A, and to help the division fulfill this mission. Section 1 classifies the identities of employees making complaints as private data when the alleged violation is the Minnesota Fair Labor Standards Act, sections, Minnesota Statute Section 181.75 or 181.96.41. This change would update the language so that the complainant, who is not necessarily always an employee, would have their identity protected as private data. Section 2 allows the commissioner to dictate the manner in which records are produced when the commissioner demands records. Section 3 gives the commissioner authority to enforce existing statutes providing that wages must be paid every 15 days and the statute prohibiting false statements as inducement to entering employment. Section 4 clarifies that when the commissioner issues a compliance order for violations of retaliation provisions, the commissioner may order reinstatement and any other appropriate relief. Section 5 updates record keeping requirements to require employers to keep records of earnings statements for three years. 
Section 6 clarifies the definition of project in the prevailing wage statute. The change is meant to help clarify the scope of work that triggers prevailing wage under the current definition, so employers are better informed prevailing wage attaches to their project. Section 7 updates voting requirements on the Nursing Home Workforce Standards Board to require that any measure passed by the board must have the support of two out of the three commission members. Sections 8 through 10 align continuation of benefits language in the pregnancy accommodations and parenting leave sections of the Women's Economic Security Act with the paid family and medical leave law. Sections 11 through 14 make changes and clarifications to child labor laws, including clarifying the existing penalty structure, adding retaliation protections, and adding liquidated damages for minors working in hazardous occupations. And I just wanted to finish by highlighting the importance of these child labor provisions in a time when child labor violations are rising across the country. Retaliation protections are necessary to ensure employees can file complaints and participate in investigations without the fear of retribution from their employer. Adding a liquidated damages provision would pro provide impacted minors with a monetary remedy when employers require them to perform hazardous work in violation of the law and to the detriment of their safety. Thank you for the opportunity to t testify in support of Senate File 4384, and I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Bly. And I believe we do have one other testifier, um, Diana Tasted Damer, I think. Okay, great. Please state your name and title for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Thanks so much. Um, thank you, Chair and committee members. My name is Diana Tassa Damer, and I'm the Legislative and Political Director for the United Food and Commercial Workers Union Local 1189. My union represents over 9,000 essential workers in meat packing, retail grocery stores, cannabis, and healthcare facilities in Minnesota. I am here today to testify in support of Senate File 4384. This bill will allow the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry the additional tools necess necessary to enforce violations of ch child labor law. Specifically, I would like to speak to section um, 13 and 14 today. So child labor and employment violations are on the rise across the country, especially in the meatpacking industry. Minnesota is unfortunately not immune to this and has seen violations um, within meatpacking. Section 13 adds liquidated damages for minors working in hazard, hazardous occupations. And Section 14 protects workers from retaliation and if an employee files a complaint with the department or if the employee participates in an investigation by the department. And we know that the labor in the meatpacking industry <coughs> is performed overwhelmingly by immigrants. And these families contribute to local economies, pay taxes, and do the hard work um, of supplying not only Minnesota's, but also America's food supply chains. <coughs> and Section 14, um, in regards to the protecting them from retaliation, helps give them um, helps give workers the knowledge and benefit of that they can come forward with um, violations of not only child labor and also employment uh, violations and gives them the protection that they don't have to lose their job for um, just speaking the truth and telling and letting the public know what's going on. So with that, I just want to say thank you to um, Chair McEwen and um, to the committee today in testifying in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Are there any other testifiers? I didn't see any on the list. Okay. If not, um, any discussion? Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator McEwen, for the bill. Uh, so I question on the voting change for Minnesota Nursing Home Workforce Standard Boards uh, with the nine members. Um, so just with the two of the commissioners have to be in on the vote. So just wondering how that yeah. uh, came to fruition, how you 
uh, didn't go with the majority, but there has to be a specific majority. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the uh, question, Senator Dornick. I'm going to go ahead and, and turn this over to uh, our official from DLI. Please state your name and title for the record and go ahead and answer the question. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. I am Josiah Moore, the Legislative Coordinator at the Department of Labor and Industry. Uh, the change to the nursing home workforce standards uh, voting in Section 7 uh, is because it's like a good, government ch good governance change uh, because under the current structure, uh, a change could be passed through the board that did not have the support of the state of Minnesota. Uh, it, it could be three votes from the employer uh, side, three votes from the employee side, and no votes from the state. Uh, and so this change is a good governance change to ensure that anything coming out of the board has the support of the state. Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, try to say this carefully. Um, so with the um, board having kind of the, or not the board, the commissioners kind of have the veto power. Um, so it seems like it waters down the voice of uh, the workers and the employers representative. So I, I'm just trying to navigate through that um, a little bit. It just seems, doesn't, I, I hear what you say. And um, yeah, so that's kind of the question. It, it seems a little uh, odd. Okay. Senator Dornick. So I'm looking for, a, uh, um, so I guess specifically then, um, so you're saying that you just feel it's in the, the commissioner's preview that they can, uh, for, the, for the, 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 the good of the state, that we have the commissioner's vote and have that power over, I'm just trying to, a little bit more clarification. That's kind of what I was hearing, but I wanted, um, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Thank you, Senator Dornick. Happy to offer, uh, yeah, a bit more clarification. I think you're right. Yeah, it, it is, from our perspective, just a good governance to have the state uh, have, need to vote in favor of standards coming out of the board. Uh, this is similar to any OSHA standards uh, done by the board already. Uh, already the commissioner has some additional review on the OSHA standards that would be passed by the board. So we have that something like this in good governance in that, in that area. Uh, and so it would expand that to any, any, uh, anything recommended or anything passed by the board in a sense. Senator Dornick. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. So with that, is the, has the board been started yet or are we still working on the members of the board? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the board has been started uh, and has been meeting routinely uh, and we do have the executive director of the board in the room today if there are more specific questions about board activities that are ongoing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, you tailed off just there at the last sentence, so if you could repeat that. Absolutely. Uh, the last thing I mentioned was that we have the executive director of the Nursing Home Workforce Standards Board in the room today if there are any more detailed questions about the activities of the board. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, yeah, that would that'd be good if she's okay with that. Please state your name and uh, title for the record. And Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Senators. My name is Leah Solo. I'm the Executive Director for the Nursing Home Workforce Standards Board. Great. Senator Dornick. <clears throat> um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So if you could just, how does it work and how is it going? And just a little uh, peek into what you guys do would be helpful. Thank Absolutely. You. Happy, happy to provide that. Um, so we were, of course, created out of the 2023 legislative session. Uh, we had our first meeting in September um, of, uh, of 2023. Um, we've been meeting monthly. Uh, we have actually divided up into three work groups. Um, each work group has a employer side, an employee side, and a commissioner or commissioner designee as part of it. 
Um, they've been working really hard to get down into uh, both understanding the work that we have in front of us and trying to uh, make the decisions that the statute lays out in front of us. Uh, we have just been, we are in the final week of our public engagement, um, our, our first round of public engagement to help us uh, set the standards, um, our first initial standards. Um, so we have done, um, we have already done three uh, public hearings, one virtual, one in Brooklyn Park, and one in Duluth. This week we'll be in Redwood Falls, and then we'll have another uh, virtual hearing, uh, or sorry, virtual public forum. Um, we also have questionnaires up on our website, one for the employer side, one for the employee side, and one for the general public um, as another way to give us feedback. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you. Appreciate your work, and uh, I look forward to maybe looking online on some of the things that you're proposing and how things are going. How often, uh, Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. how often do you vote then? Uh, how often does that come up where you're in work groups and stuff? I'm guessing you're just getting ideas and towards the end, or have you had any votes yet, or how does that work? Great question, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator. Uh, we have had, let's see, so we've had, I guess, six um, board meetings. I think I think we're at about six board, board meetings so far. Um, we have drafted an initial um, set of rules around the certification of worker, worker organizations. Um, so we had an initial vote on that. And then we actually, um, based on feedback that we uh, got on those, we had uh, two sets of amendments to those. So we've had three big votes. Um, and uh, and we've had um, e you know just little votes on you know approving our plan for public engagement, for instance. Um, I think so far we have only had one dissenting vote in all of those votes. They've been very consensus oriented. Thank you, Ms. Solo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I look at this particular provision, I wouldn't say it's good governance. I'd say it's poor governance, to tell you the truth. You know, basically you have, we're moving the situation to where the people who don't do the work are, can negate what the employers and the employees want to do. I'm actually much more comfortable with the current situation where employers and employees can actually pass something in spite of the commissioner objection, because they know it's what's right for the patients or the uh, residents, versus uh, people who don't do the actual work being able to negate what they want to do. Uh, and I guess I've, I've seen that through experience. And so I would encourage uh, Senator McEwen to delete this change or to thoroughly vet it and realize that empowering an employer and employee situation, even where there's a lot of government involved, uh, to make decisions that maybe commissioners who don't do the actual work. Now, if you go out there and do the actual work, you know, uh, it's different. But the direction we're going sounds like something's come up at one of your board meetings, and now all of a sudden we're uh, concerned that the employer-employee might pass something that the commissioners don't rubber stamp. And I definitely... Uh, think that's the wrong direction to take this. Otherwise, I like the bill. I, I especially, Senator McEwen, appreciate bringing the child labor uh, consequences in because I do think that's a major concern, not only in our state, but across the country. And I sincerely appreciate that. But I do have a little uh, difference of opinion on this particular provision. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No questions. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Grunhagen. I appreciate you sharing your concerns about this provision. We'll certainly continue discussions on it and, and take a look. Thanks. Any further discussion? Mr. Chair, I was... Yep, yep. Senator Dornick. So, Mr. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator McEwen, I, I don't... Uh, didn't get over this as quickly. I spent... Uh, so, the employer liability part... 
Um, if you could kind of maybe walk through that or explain that a little bit more. The, um, uh, specifically, let's see, the commissioner may order employee to reimburse the department and attorney general. So that's the cost to impose extreme. So just maybe kind of go over that a little bit of the employer liability and the cost and, and the hardship and some of those things. Um, that would be appreciated. Senator McKeown. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Dornick. Um, I'm going to go ahead and defer to our expert from DLA. Ms. Bly. Mr. Chairman, members, and Senator, um, I think you're referring to under 181A08, the powers and duties of the department, and that's in the child labor statute. Um, the section on employer liability is, um, it's, it is, Basically, if the commissioner finds that there has been um, violations of the child labor law and they issue a compliance order, what they want, the commissioner wants to be able to have is the ability to take swift order to issue a cease and desist without having to go to the court. Um, in some cases, you know, the commissioner always has the ability and the power to go and file a case in the district court, but since child labor can sometimes have very serious consequences, this provision permits the commissioner to go and issue the cease and desist without, um, as a result of the compliance order, without having to take that lengthy process. And then it also, um, it also, clarifies that the commissioner does have the ability to seek damages if, if the commissioner is forced to go to court and get those reimbursed for the state for the, and the attorney general's office if they need to go to court to enforce these provisions of the child labor statute. So, Ms. Chair, do they have to pay them up front or after the, after the judgment? It would be after the judgment, so it would be a typical of like a usual litigation situation where the commissioner would seek damages. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Guys, real quick. So are they guilty till proven innocent, or are they innocent till proven guilty under this provision? I was just, I'm, I just was scanning this and then based upon the comments that were made. Ms. Bly. Chairman, Senator, um, the, the, the way that the, the compliance order goes is that the commissioner can issue a compliance order, and then and if an employer disagrees with it, they, they can file an objection. If it's going to be, um, in a, if it's gonna be a disputed compliance order, it goes to the Office of Administrative Hearings. And at that point, it's much like a regular civil court case. Um, and so if, if the commissioner, the commissioner wants to be able to use this ability to be reimbursed if, if she's ended, or the commissioner has ended up prevailing in, at the Office of Administrative Hearings. So reimbursed if they prevail. So in other words, they're innocent to prove it guilty, correct? I mean, we don't want to turn everything upside down on its head. I mean, we... Mr. Chair, Ms. if Bob. I may... Or, uh, excuse me, Chair McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Grunhagen. I, I do think, I, I have to speak as a former, former public defender myself and as an attorney, that I think that you might be conflating criminal law with these these, the approach that an agency will take with a business to impose civil penalties or to impose a cease and desist order. There is a process under the law whereby a business can have their, their, the complaint against them adjudicated. And in that sense, there isn't like a, in our whole system, there's innocence until proven, but there's not, it's not like a guilty thing. It's like they'd be found liable. They'd be found to have committed these acts if, if they were guilty of them. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're not conflating the criminal context with this, uh, this agency and adjudication context. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that clarification, Senator McEwen. So in other words, they don't have to pay until they're actually proven guilty, correct? Chair and Senator, Ms. I believe this, this provision is 
Yes, upon conclusion of the proceedings, if the employer has, and after the contested hearing, the employer has been found to have committed these violations of the Child Labor Act, that's when they would pay. Mr. Chair, they could also, I mean, I'm not exactly sure about the nuance of the process, but but employers could go ahead if they just decided um, that they were admitting to having to be liable for this, they could go ahead and just decide to pay whatever the fines would be. So there's different, you know, they, are they going to fight the act? There's an accusation made against an employer. Are they going to just say, yep, that's true, we did it, we'll pay the fine, or are they going to fight it? Are they saying, no, we, we shouldn't be liable for whatever reason? Any further discussion? Okay, does someone want to move, or Madam Chair, do you want to move the Senate file 4384 to be referred to the Judiciary and Public Safety Committee? So moved. Okay. Those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. There being, or yeah, we'll send it to Judiciary and Public Safety. Thank you. And we are adjourned. Thank you.